words cannot express. Only eternity will vindicate and validate all that John Perkins has meant to the body of Christ in general and to me personally. As he has stated, our relationship goes back many, many years to my college days where I was exposed to his testimony and then got to meet him and where he helped quicken within me a burden for holistic ministry that we're having the privilege of living out today in the context of our fellowship here in the southern section of Dallas where we are seeing God do some unusual things through our uh, community development agency and of course nationally as we work with churches through the urban alternative uh, so we are deeply uh, gratuitous to John Perkins and to this great organization that has been crafted behind his vision and then for the opportunity to speak and to share which I consider uh, one of the highest honors not primarily because of size or uh, the amount of chairs in the room, but because of significance, that you represent the creme de la creme of the kingdom of God because of what you do. So thank you for the privilege of being with you today. Let's pray. Father, as we take a few moments to unearth the greatness of your word, we pray that you will take the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart and make them acceptable to you. In Jesus' name, amen. In Europe, many years ago, in sanitariums where they would test the mental capacity of people, they had crude ways of determining whether someone was ready to from these mental institutions. One of the ways was to take an inmate of a sanitarium and to put them in a closet, in a janitor's closet with a mop, to put the stopper in the sink, turn the water on, and let the water overflow the sink and then ask the inmate to clean up the mess. The person who would leave the inmate would then leave and come back in 10 minutes. If the water was still running and the person was still mopping, they knew they weren't ready to go anywhere yet. <laughs> For they had not developed the capacity to get to the root of the problem. A lot of ministry is done mopping up messes rather than unplugging stoppers. Uh, with trying to mop up the mess, but the water is still running, overflowing the banks. The core of what we are about is getting to the root of the problem, which is why we are Christian ministries, operating in a lot of different venues in a lot of different ways, all comprehensively desiring to show what the gospel looks like when it is fleshed out, not merely when it is proclaimed. I'd like to take these few moments that I've been given today to unearth a theology of ministry given by Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 is a very critical passage and we will be very didactic this, this day as we go through this great prophetic passage where Jesus himself outlines his ministry program theology and philosophy of ministry. A question has been set forth by Jesus himself and that has been set forth in verse 13. Who do people say the Son of Man is? The question is what is the popular viewpoint about Jesus Christ here in Caesarea Philippi? The disciples respond by saying well there are many viewpoints. Some say that you are John the Baptist. They have heard your fiery calls to repentance and have concluded that you are the reincarnation of John. Others, however, have seen your miraculous activity and given that the Old Testament prophesied Elijah would return, some have concluded that you are Elisha. There are still others, verse 14, they've heard your prophetic utterances, your prophecies about the future, and have aligned you with Jeremiah or one of the other Old Testament prophetic voices. But then Jesus changes the question. He says, but who do you say that I am? He first asked the question, who do 
or what does the populace in general say? They do not have agreement in the marketplace about who I am. But who do you say that I am? Now, in the Greek text, you cannot see it in the English, but in the Greek text, the word you is plural. In Texas, we would say, who do y'all say the Son of Man is? In other words, this question was not asked to an individual disciple. It was asked to the group of disciples, which is probably one of the most prolific observations one can make about this passage. Please keep in mind, the question is not to Peter. The question, you, is plural. It is to the group of the disciples. However, Peter speaks up in verse 16. So Peter is not speaking merely personally. Peter is speaking representatively because Peter is speaking on behalf of the group to whom the question was asked. Who do you, plural, y'all say the Son of Man is? And so the response that is given by Peter is representative of the group, all of course except for Judas, where Jesus uh, has asked the question whether there is a consensus from the group. Peter speaks and Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He makes that great Christological statement of the deity of Jesus Christ as Messiah, Christ, as the divine one, Son of the living God, that is, bearing the nature of deity. Jesus then responds to Peter. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, verse 17 says, son of John, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, that is, this is not a human conclusion. But my Father who is in heaven. Now all of that is designed to introduce us to the two verses I want to talk about predominantly this morning, verses 18 and 19. Jesus' theology, methodology, and philosophy of ministry. Jesus has affirmed Peter's declaration, which was an answer to a question offered or asked to the group. And Jesus says, I say to you that you are Peter. He was first called Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon son of John, but he's now been given a new name. Now, it is normative in the Bible for God to change people's names. Throughout the Bible, Abram becomes Abraham. All through the Bible, you see name changes. Name changes in Scripture are designed to identify character. So God changes your name. In fact, parents would give their children names in the Jewish economy in order to reflect either existing character, changes in character, or anticipations of character. For example, a mother would name the child hoping that the child would become what the name reflected uh, that the mother desired in naming the child that particular name. So Peter here is given a new name. The Greek word Peter is Petros. Petros means a stone. Peter is the one who has spoken out, he's led the way, he is the leader of the disciples. Wherever you see the list of disciples in the New Testament, in the, in the Gospels, Peter's name is always first. He is the spokesperson. He is the one who will open the church doors on the day of Pentecost. He is the leader of the group. And so Jesus says, Peter, we're going to set you out as the stone, the leader, the spokesperson. However, I am not going to build my program around a good preacher. I am not going to build my program around a great leader. I'm not going to build my pro program against someone who is out front, out of necessity, but he is not the sum total of what I am doing. He says, I'm going to build my program not on a Petros, but on a Petra. The Greek word Petra is translated in the text rock. I will build my church upon this rock this rock. Peter is Petros, stone. Rock is Petra. In classical Greek, the word rock was used of a collection of stones that had become knitted together 
to form a rocky ledge or a larger slab. Now, you can go to Bible libraries or seminary libraries, and you will find volumes of discussion on this word rock. Most conclude that the word rock is a reference to Jesus himself. A second explanation is that the word rock is a word not directly referring to Jesus, but more indirectly referring to Jesus, referring more to the confession of Peter about Jesus. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And of course, that becomes the confession of the church upon which the church is built. And while both of those viewpoints do have some uh, basis, I would like to conclude that that is not the meaning of rock. Because I am going back to a statement I made a moment ago, and that is that Jesus' question is not to Peter. Jesus' question is to the group. Who do you, plural, say the Son of Man is? So either Jesus has skipped the group and no longer is talking to them, or he is now including the group since he was talking to the group in the first place. I'd like to suggest Peter speaks for the group. Jesus responds to Peter as leader and spokesperson for the group, but that Jesus has not forgotten his original question, which was in fact to the group. Peter, you're the leader, you're the stone, you're going to lead the way. However, in order to do what I plan to do in history, one great leader can't pull this off. What I need is Petra, a collection of stones that have been knitted together to form something bigger than any Petros could ever do on their own. Now, the question is, how can I exegetically validate that that is the definition of rock? Well, there is a system of theology or a, um, a uh, approach to theology that is called biblical theology. Biblical theology is somewhat distinct from systematic theology. Systematic theology uses all sources to gather data about any one subject and organizes it according to that topic so that you can then have a system for looking at any particular biblical subject from all the sources that data can be gotten from in order to come up with that organized system of theological conclusions. But there always is preceding systematic theology, biblical theology. Biblical theology goes to a specific author or a specific context to draw out what that particular context or author is saying about that particular subject. So biblical theology is concerned about what a particular book says or what a particular person says or what a particular passage says as opposed to what all the Bible says on a given subject. Well, the best exegete, since the Bible is the best interpreter of itself, the best exegete of what was meant by Jesus' word rock would be Peter himself, since Peter is the one who's, one, been sectioned off as a stone out of that rock, and two, uses the same language in his own writing. When you read 1 Peter 2, Peter says this, You are all spiritual stones, that have come together to form one spiritual house. He brings together the collection of stones and says, but you are now not individual entities. You have been called together, your theme for this conference. You have been coming together, and I want you to form in your togetherness something bigger than any one of you could form on your own. That is the greatest validation of this great conference because while all of us are leaders in our own right and have the uniquenesses of our own ministry, what you have decided is the CCDA represents something bigger than any ministry independently that does not negate your independence, your uniqueness, or your own individual calling, but it reminds you you are hooked in to something bigger. So I would like to suggest that the rock here refers to the coming together of the leadership of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, more broadly, the leadership of the church, to create something bigger than could be ever created by a talented stone. John Perkins is our stone, but this gathering represents God's rock. 
in the area of Christian community development. And he says, it's, on, it's upon the rock, not the stone, that I will build what I'm doing in history and in society. I will build my church. The Greek word for church is ekklesia. Ekklesia means called out ones, those called out from this world order, from this kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. And it is called the church. And the gates of hell shall not overpower it. I am going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not overpower it. I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not overpower it. Please make some very important observations here. First of all, Jesus is on the offensive, not the defensive. I am building my church. Hell is trying to stop me. I'm not trying to stop hell. There is a philosophy out here that I might call backwards Christian soldiers where we are spending an inordinate amount of time stopping hell when hell really ought to be spending an inordinate amount of time stopping heaven because rather than playing the defensive position, Jesus says, I have the ball and I'm doing the building. Hell is trying to stop me, okay? It says that hell can't stop me. One of the ways you know whether your ministry is on track with God is who's stopping who. If hell is stopping you, then you can't be building what Jesus is building because Jesus says hell can't stop me. I'm building my church and hell can't stop me. So the way you know it's mine is hell's losing. So if hell is winning, you can't be building what he's building, even though you may be using his name in building it. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, prevail has to do with uh, ultimate uh, victory. It does not mean that there won't be conflicts. It does not mean that there will not be attacks. It simply means there will not be prevailing. That is, there won't be ultimate overcoming. Now, this implies that hell will try to do that. Hell is going to seek to prevail. It just won't be able to prevail. Now, this leads us to a very important theological uh, uh, discussion that I would like to bring to your attention now. And it's going to take me about um, 10 minutes to do this, uh, to kind of condense about 20 hours of lecture into about 10 minutes right now. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There is a false theology, even among evangelical Christians today, that has thwarted, I believe, our effectiveness that is being brought out here by Jesus' theological statement that really also reflects his philosophy of ministry. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. The faulty theological statement is, that there is a battle in the universe today going on between God and the devil to see who will prevail. Now let me explain something. To say there is a battle between God and the devil is like saying there was a fight outside today between Tony Evans and Mike Tyson. Now, there may have been a fight, but you can bank your bottom dollar. It didn't last long. You cannot have a fight between an omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God and a creature. And it lasts long. Our battle is not, or the battle is not between God and the devil. That's like a no contest situation, all right? The battle is against hell seeking to overthrow the church. The church is made up of people. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers located in heavenly places, Ephesians 6, of course. Now, there's a theology that undergirds this whole thing because we get in this thing where there's a battle between God and Satan, and, and, and that is to misunderstand the conflict. 
Jesus is building the church, and the battle is between the church and hell, not between God and the devil. Let's understand this battle a little bit theologically. God's first created beings were angels. God created angels hierarchically, that is, he created angels in accordance with a chain of command. At the top of the chain was the chief angel, archangel, and his name was Lucifer, known as the Shining One. To understand Lucifer's <coughs> relationship to the other angels would be like going to a car lot, seeing cars on the lot, but then going on the showroom floor and seeing the one situated there. All the angels were beautifully created beings, but God created a, show, a, sh a showroom model. His name was Lucifer. He was the shining one. He is described in graphic detail in Ecclesi uh, Ezekiel 28 as being this diamond-studded, ruby-studded uh, being who, who had uh, organs for his throat, the Bible says. He was the music leader. He led in worship, which is why he has a problem today with praise and worship. It reminds him of his old job. He, 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 he used to lead the angels in the, in the worship of God. But we are told in Ezekiel 28 that pride swelled up in his heart. He looked into the mirror and said, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? Obviously not giving the mirror a chance to answer, he said he was. That led to a coup. The first coup in history, or outside of history, because this is happening before time has begun, where Lucifer seeks to equate himself with God. Isaiah 14 says that five times he said, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Negative volition. The bottom line is, I will be like the Most High. Now, what was it about God that Lucifer wanted so bad? One thing. God was the only person in the universe who didn't have to answer to anybody else. He wanted independence. That's why the definition of sin is independence from God. He did not want to have to answer to God. He wanted to be the one that all the other created beings had to answer to. So he led a coup. This coup was so successful that one-third of all the angels created, out of the millions and millions and perhaps billions of angels that were created, went with Lucifer in his coup. Now, when you run a game on an omniscient being, omniscience being the doctrine that God not only knows all that is, he knows all that could be. So he knows what if as well as what is. It's hard to trick, hide, or fool such a being. Therefore, his coup was uncovered. When his coup was uncovered, a trial was held. A literal trial, as we would know trials today, which is why the Bible speaks in such legal language, why God often speaks in terms of courts and, and uh, legalities, where he was brought to trial. We are told what happened at the trial. He was found guilty of treason and he was sentenced. The sentence is given to us in Matthew chapter 12, verse 41, where it says that the devil and his angels was prepared for them eternal fire. So they were found, found guilty, and this was the uh, sentence. Jesus makes an important statement regarding the trial when he says in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, these words. I was there, he says, when, when Satan fell from heaven like lightning. Now that verse is, two, uh, is important for two reasons. Number one, Jesus says, I was there, which means he existed before his creation uh, into, uh, into flesh. The second thing it tells us is that at the trial, Satan got a name change. His name was Lucifer, but Jesus says it was Satan who fell from heaven like lightning. Because remember, God always changes your name to fit your character. He used to be the shining one, and now he is the adversary of God. Why did he fall from heaven like lightning and where did he go? Both Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 tell us where he was exiled to. He was exiled to the third planet from the sun, planet Earth. The Bible tells us that he was removed from heaven, obviously, because of his rebellion, all he and his angels, 
and were sent to planet Earth. Now that question is why? God had a meeting. We call it in theology decrees where God established a meeting to determine history. God decided that rather than carry out the sentence of eternal fire right away, that God would use the rebellion of Satan to accomplish his greater glory. God does everything for his greater glory. Whenever God can come up with something that will give him more glory, he'll use it, including the devil. He saw that the, op that the rebellion of the devil gave him the opportunity to show his greater power, and even more importantly, according to Ephesians 1, his greater grace. And so rather than carry out the sentence, Lucifer and his angels were exiled to planet Earth. That's why you can now open your Bible. When you open your Bible, you open your Bible to a place without form or void, where darkness is upon the face of the deep, where the water and the land are all coagulated, which is a swamp, in other words, when you open your Bible, you open your Bible to a cosmic mess as far as earth is concerned. That is because the events I just described took place prior to, prior to Satan's location on the earth. When you open up your Bible, you open up your Bible to Satan being located on the earth, which is why the serpent is already ready to go when Adam and Eve are placed on the earth because Satan already exists on the earth. And the reason he already exists on the earth is he's been exiled to the earth. And the reason he's been exiled to the earth is because it's cosmic rebellion. What God decided in his council meeting with the other two members of the council, the Spirit and the Son, was that what they would do was use this as an opportunity to really demonstrate his greater glory. And so what God did was he decided to create an inferior creature. Or in the words of Psalm 8 and in Hebrews 2, we will create man a little lower than the angels. That is constitutionally inferior. Without the ability to fly around at will, without the supernatural intelligence. And we will do this in order to do one simple thing. To demonstrate what God can do with the less. When less is dependent upon him, then he can do with more when more is in rebellion against him. And so God made angels inferior, a man inferior to angels, and then he created man and said, now here's how we're going to work this. The only way you're going to be able to defeat an angel is by my word. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you my word, and then I'm going to let the angels mess with you. I am not going to interfere with them messing with you, but remember, the only way you can defeat an angel is with my word. So you have an angel showing up, talking to Eve, deceiving Eve, which leads to the deception of Adam or the, the disobedience of Adam and the fall. What you have in Genesis is the bringing of this world order under the authority of Satan like the one-third of the angels that came under the authority of Satan. So that what now you have is the battle in history called time where there is this conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, not between God and the devil, but between God's creation, man, and his previous creation, angels. God lets these two creative beings go in opposition to one another because his plan is still the same. To demonstrate what he can do with less, when less is dependent and obedient to him, than what he can do with more angels who are in rebellion against him. So all of biblical history now is the outworking of this plan where God would find and use a man and a ministry who was less powerful than the angels who rebelled, but who was in obedience to him. So Adam and Eve rebelled, they fell, they repented, God provided them redemptive covering. Cain kills Abel under the influence of the evil one. But because of God's move, there is the creation of Seth. And men again call on the name of the Lord. The Nephilim contaminate the human race. God finds a man named Noah, tells him to build a boat on dry land, preach a three-word sermon, it's going to rain, and God starts it all over again. A black man rises to the, to the scene called Nimrod. 
not one of the not one of the heroes of the African race, mind you, who builds two civilizations. He builds Babylon and he builds Assyria and he leads them to the Tower of Babel where God confuses the language, goes to Ur, finds a man named Abraham and creates his own nation that will obey. That nation gets captured in an evil place called Egypt led by false gods. God goes and he finds in uh, Midian a man named Moses and he says, let my people go. And so it's one move after another move, but always through a man. You have between the Old Testament and the New Testament 400 silent years. 400 years where there is no new word from God. At the end of the 400 years, God begins to speak again, and he speaks in terms of a, 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 of a, a, a description of the history of the Old Testament through personalities called a genealogy. So and so we got so and so we got so and so we got so and so. You come to Matthew chapter 1, verse 16, who begot Joseph, who was married to Mary, by whom was born Jesus Christ. Up until this time, God would find a man and use a man. But in the New Testament, God decided he would approach this differently. He himself would become a man and pick up the battle himself because it had to be won by a man. So Jesus Christ now, as the lead man, has now built his own constituency called the church. And he says, the church which I am building, the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. And so you and I are battling angels. It is your ability to beat angels that's the key. That's why we fight not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Now that may raise the question, how do we defeat angels in our ministry collectively since we're dealing with an invisible power that influences the visible reality that we are part of? Well, God says, here's how you do it, verse 19. I will give you keys. That's what he says. Keys. The way you whip angels, the gates of hell, who are trying to whip me through the church, is with your key ring. Now, I am sure that you've had situations like me where you in a hurry to go somewhere and couldn't find your keys, which means you're not going anywhere. If you're trying to go somewhere and you can't find your keys, you're not going anywhere. No matter how sincerely you want to go somewhere. Because if you've got to drive, you've got to have a key to get there. Or perhaps some of you are like me. You have, your key, you have keys on your key ring and you don't know what they go to. He says, I will give you keys. But notice what the keys belong to. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. The greatest failure in the church of Jesus Christ today is its loss of a kingdom perspective of ministry. Please note what the keys do not belong to. They do not belong to the church. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'm going to give the church the keys that belong to the kingdom. Which means if you don't understand the kingdom, you can't use the keys. Your keys won't work in my car. Because they have not been fitted for my car. Your keys will work in your car, my keys will work in my car, but they will not work in our cars, conversely, because they only fit doors or locks where they have been made for. The keys belong to the kingdom. The definition of kingdom, from the Greek word basilia, which means rule or authority, is the comprehensive rule of God over all of his creation. Or to put it another way, the kingdom is bigger than the church. The kingdom is bigger than the church. Now, the church is critical because that's what Jesus is building. The church is critical 
because that's the only entity to whom the keys have been given. But the keys don't unlock church doors. They unlock kingdom doors. Why is it that we have all these churches on all these corners with all these preachers, all these deacons, all these programs, all these auxiliaries, all these facilities, all this money, all these choirs, and still have all this mess. There's a dead monkey on the line somewhere. The dead monkey is that the church exists for the church and not for the kingdom. And once the church exists for the church and misses the bigger program of God, which is his kingdom, it becomes an ingrown institution which does not facilitate the program of God. And so they wind up with buildings and people and sermons, but with a negligible impact in the culture. The CDs, CCDA has, uh, is critical for two important reasons. One, because it ought to be an extension of the church connected to the church. All right? In other words, you are an expression of the church in the area of meeting or impacting the broader society because the broader society is included in the church. You say, I mean, excuse me, the broader society is included in the kingdom. The broader society is not included in the church. The church is made up of people who have professed faith alone in Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. That's how you get in the church. But the kingdom is bigger than the church. The kingdom has to do with the presence of Jesus Christ in this world order. I like the way Ephesians, which is a, 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 a really a... a, a an exposition of this concept says it. It says it in every chapter it talks about it. But he says at the end of the book of Ephesians that, uh, oops, my time's run out here. But he says at the end of the book of Ephesians that, that, that uh, 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 Jesus Christ is head of the body. We are his body. Now, what, what's the job of a body? The job of a body is one thing, to carry out the dictates of the head. That, that's the only thing a body does, all right? That is the only thing your body does. Your brain says right arm move, your right arm moves. Your, your brain says left foot move, your left foot moves. If your body is moving and your brain's not talking, you need a doctor. You are a very sick person. If you start, you start, you start, you start, you start involuntary movements, you know, you're sick. Because the only job of the body is to fulfill the dictates, Okay. But watch this now. It says, we are his body. And it says, Jesus Christ is head, watch this, over all things. This is uh, Ephesians 1, to 23. It says, Jesus is head over all things, but watch this, but given only to the church. Now, that's key. He's over everything. That's kingdom. But he's only been given the one thing, the church. What's the church's job then? To be his body. What's the job of a body? To fulfill the dictates of the head. We are the fullness of him, verse 23 says, who fills all in all. Jesus Christ is head over the church, but Jesus Christ has chosen to limit the location of his deity to the location of his humanity. In other words, when Jesus was on earth, he was God, but he limited the operation of his deity to the location of his humanity. In other words, he functioned one place at a time. Even though he is sovereign God, he functioned to the location of his humanity. And he's still doing that today. The only difference is his body is everywhere. So his humanity now exists through every believer in Jesus Christ who makes up the church. And we are the fullness of him who fills all in all. In other words, we are the continuation of the incarnation. We are the ones who deliver Jesus outside of the church where that delivery needs to be located. How will General Motors know that Jesus Christ is Lord through the believers who work at General Motors? How will governments know that Jesus is Lord 
through those who've been called to be politicians in the world of government. How will actors and how will the world of entertainment know Jesus is Lord through those who've been called to represent the kingdom of God in the realm of entertainment? How will the poor know that Jesus is Lord through those of us who have been called to take the gospel there? It is through we, humanity, filling him that the kingdom works. Now, what, are the, what then are the keys? The keys are very simple. The keys are biblical responses, divinely orchestrated responses, keys, because the keys are called in the book of Revelation, the word of God. It is the divine response, not to the church, but to the broader society over which the kingdom rules. That means we are not to be this ingrown people only concerned about our little congregation. We are supposed to prepare that congregation to invade enemy territory with the rules of the king. The church is supposed to be like a, 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 a America has um, all over the world. We, we, we have embassies, American embassies. American embassies are sovereign territories. Every embassy is a sovereign territory. It doesn't belong to the country it's in. It belongs to the country it represents. It's run by Americans, led by an ambassador. In an American embassy, American laws rule. So if you're in trouble, you get in trouble, you go to an American embassy, and because American laws rule there, okay? But embassies are located in foreign lands. All an American embassy is, is a little bit of America a long way from home. Guess what the church is supposed to be? A little bit of heaven a long way from home. It is supposed to be in history where the rules of eternity are operative so that this foreign land can see what heaven looks like when heaven situates itself in its midst. We are aliens in a foreign land operating from rules from another kingdom, sovereign territory, influencing the culture. In any embassy around the world, you will always, particularly non-Western embassies, find people applying all day long for visas to the United States. They do that because of the presence of America on foreign soil. The impact of the kingdom of God through the church of Jesus Christ ought to be so powerful that lines wrap around applying for visas for heaven because of the presence of God's people having a presence in the broader society. My time is up, but in, in, in movies, they have uh, previews of, of coming attractions. Or television, they show you clips of the show coming up next week. These are always the hot clips. Fight scene, love scene, or chase scene, always. Because they want you to tune in. These hot clips are lying one right next to another because they want you really to tune in. Well, uh, the show may be terrible, but you never know it from the clips. Clips are always hot. Brothers and sisters, one day there's a big show coming to town. God is the producer, the Holy Spirit is the director, Jesus is the superstar, and it will be a worldwide production. It's called The Kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is going to set up shop over whole, all of planet Earth and run his whole kit and caboodle like it ought to be run. But in the meantime, he's left behind some previews of coming attractions. That's you and your ministry and your impact and, and your outreach to the places where God has called you. You are the hot clips of the upcoming show. People are supposed to see the clips that you show and get interested in the whole program. Your clips ought to be so impactful and so hot that they're going to want to know when the whole show is coming to town. And when they discover you're part of a bigger show, they're going to want to buy a ticket. And when they come to you asking you how much is the ticket, you can tell them, don't worry about it. The price has already been paid. God bless you.